Today, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 10. Now, as followers of Jesus, or maybe you're here exploring the Christian faith, we always say that when you choose to follow Christ, your life takes on new meaning and purpose. But what is that purpose? Well, one of the purposes that Jesus has for your life and for mine is revealed in our passage today. And it's to carry the presence of Jesus with you into every situation and place that you go. So let's read Luke 10, and then I will unpack this a bit more. So this is Luke 10. We're going to read verses 1 to 20. I'll read it to you. After this, the Lord, that is Jesus, appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful. Now, that's not literally go and do some farming. That means the harvest is people were spiritually hungry, ready to hear about him. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, in other words, travel light, and do not greet anyone on the road. In other words, no chit chat la, it's urgent. Go. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you, apart from durian. No, no, maybe you love durian. Eat that as well. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it'll be more bearable on that day for Sodom, for that town. Sodom was uh, a town in the Old Testament that was destroyed by the fire of God. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it'll be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, Will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you'll go down to Hades, to the depths. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample, trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, Jesus, by this point, has already sent out the 12 disciples, and he's, he told them to go to the towns where he had just himself visited. In other words, to go after him to those places. But here, now, in Luke 10, Jesus sends out a slightly bigger team, the 72, and he tells them to go to the places where he's about to go. In other words, to go ahead of him. But today, as followers of Jesus, 
after his death, resurrection, ascension, and Pentecost, when Jesus sent the Spirit, his presence, to come and live and dwell within each and every one of us who choose to follow him. It means that we no longer go ahead of Jesus, nor do we go behind him, but as we go, we carry the presence of Jesus with us and in us. Every place we go, you now take his presence with you, and that is part of the very purpose of our lives. This is why the New Testament calls Christians the body of Christ. So let's say later on this evening, you have a family dinner. You bring Jesus to that table. Or tomorrow morning, maybe as you're commuting. That's Jesus on the commute. As you enter your place of work, you go to your desk or your workstation, you bring Jesus to work. Jesus is going to work with you. Or let's say you're dropping the children at school tomorrow morning. That is Jesus on the school run. We carry his presence with us into every situation, into every relationship, into every interaction in our lives. And if we realize this, suddenly life seems a lot bigger. It seems more profound because every interaction, every step that we take has a significance. Life seems more exciting. And in this way, the Christian life is sort of summed up by just one word, one word that Jesus commands in verse 3, go. The Christian life is about going, but it's not just an aimless, let's just go anywhere. It's carry Christ everywhere. But if you're anything like me, you might have days when you feel you don't do this very well because you know, yes, we might carry the presence of Jesus into our situations, but we also can carry a whole load of life baggage along with us as well. So how can we intentionally represent Jesus and take his presence effectively into every place and interaction in our lives? Well, in this passage we just read, Jesus gives us six things we can do, which thankfully all start with the letter P, which is a preacher's dream, to how we can effectively do this. So are you ready? These are the six P's of carrying the presence of Jesus in our everyday. And the first one is this, pray. Pray. And specifically, pray for others to catch this vision for their lives too. In verse 2, Jesus says this, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Ask, pray. Your God-given remit is this. You're to release leaders in the kingdom of God through the key of prayer. And Jesus tells us to pray that others would catch this vision of being the body of Christ, of intentionally living it out to carry his presence. And it's very interesting the way he does it. He tells the disciples to pray for these workers to be sent out. And then the very next thing he says to them is, so go. I'm sending you out. Hey, Jesus, which is it? Am I, am I meant to pray for leaders or am I meant to go? As a, it's both. This is so often how prayer works, isn't it? You know, sometimes we pray and God just does something miraculously completely out of our control. But often when we pray, God says, great, I've heard you. Now you go and be part of the answer to that prayer. I'm giving you the dignity of partnership in this. I think in my own life, in, back in a long time ago, 1995, 
I had the chance to go and spend a month and a half, two months, living in rural China. Now, back in 1995, China was not the sort of great modern country that it is today. So, to say that I had culture shock was an understatement. <laughs> And where I was in rural China, many, many of the people there, they'd never seen a non-Chinese person before. So their entire worldview of what lived outside of their village was me. They thought all foreigners looked like me. Poor things. And, you know, if you know anything about the English, we don't like to stand out. We don't like to draw attention to ourselves. It was a nightmare because, of course, I stood out and everybody was fascinated to go and see, you know, the weird guy. So they would stare, they'd follow me, they'd prod me, hey, is he real? <laughs> I just couldn't get any personal space at all. Even when I went to the loo, faces would appear over the cubicle. I was once wearing shorts, standing there. Ow, what's that? I looked down, there was an old man pulling hair out of my leg. <laughs> Everywhere I went, I was followed. After a couple of months, I went back home to England. I got there and I thought, oh, it's so nice to be home. I thought about my amazing experience. I thought, do you know what? China's amazing. It needs to hear the gospel. Lord, I'm going to commit to pray for the church in China. But I'm so glad I'm never going there again. <laughs> and I began to pray, and it was only just within four months later, I received a profound calling on my life to serve the church in China. <laughs> we pray. God says, I've heard. Now go. Be part of the answer. And you know what? Whatever you do or wherever you go, one of the specific ways in which you can pray is to ask the Lord to give you partners. We read in verse 1 that Jesus sends them out two by two. We're not meant to do this alone. Pray that God would make you aware of other Christians with whom you can do life together. Get together with other Christians at work and pray for one another. Even if you've not done it before, it might seem a bit awkward or weird at first. Just lunchtime, get together, pray. Pray for each other, pray for your workplace. Maybe you're, you're not aware that there even is another Christian in your workplace. Ask the Lord to send you one. Mums, pray with other mums. Dads, pray with other dads. Or get into a connect group. Share Prayer needs with others. That can be the prayer support that you need, two by two. Don't do it alone. But part of the way in which you bring Christ into every situation is by praying for others. The second P in which we do this is peace. Carry the peace of Christ wherever you go. Verse 5, Jesus says, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. When Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, came and descended upon him and rested upon him. Now that same Spirit rests upon you and me. Wherever you go, you take the spirit of peace with you. Peace is a fruit of the spirit. Jesus is the prince of peace. So if you carry his presence, you carry peace. You carry that same dove upon you. I'm not saying literally, right? But you can maybe find it helpful. Maybe tomorrow... Maybe the atmosphere in your workplace is a bit toxic or in your family or something and you're a bit anxious about going in there. You can imagine the dove of peace 
the Spirit of Christ on your shoulder as you walk into that place. You carry peace there. Jesus said, didn't he, that blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. But every believer in Christ is a child of God. In other words, we're all called to be peacemakers. So I wonder, where do you need to bring peace, the peace of Christ in your life? Where do you need to be the peacemaker? I was once helping lead a a small group on Alpha and um, week one, a guy turned up as a guest. He, He was not a Christian and he didn't really say much week one or two or three actually, but eventually he came back and that night he shared with the group that he had become a Christian. We were like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, How, When, when did this happen? And he explained how he'd been really suffering with anxiety and panic attacks, but it had stopped the minute he'd started coming along to Alpha. And he said, I think I know when it happened. He said, as I greeted you all the first week and you shook my hands, I felt this warmth go up my arm and into my heart and this peace. He said, I know it's Jesus. You know, you carry the spirit of peace even if you don't realize. And Jesus gives us another little tip as well. He says, look out for people of peace. Verse six. Uh, If a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. And a person of peace here is the one who opens up their house to the disciples and gives them food and helps them and and looks after them and, and sort of refreshes them. You know, a person of peace may not necessarily even be a Christian, but this is someone who is a gift of God to you in your life someone who is sympathetic and eager to help. And God will send you people of peace in your life when you need it. I think of when we were renovating this amazing building that was a nightclub. The architect is not a Christian, but he's a person of peace. He was so excited about the project. He gave it his all. He went above and beyond. He was a gift of God to us, a person of peace. Have the eyes to look out for these people in your life, because when you see them, you'll realize they are God sent and a huge help. Thirdly, the third way we can effectively carry the presence of Jesus into situations and everywhere we go is another uh, P for prayer, but this time it's pray for healing. Now, just to clarify a few, th- a few things about sickness and healing. You know, sometimes, occasionally, sickness might be because of sin. For example, if I took a load of hard drugs over and over again, I'd probably get sick. But more often than not, sickness is not because of the person's sin. It's simply because we live in a fallen world. How do we know this? Well, in John chapter nine, do you remember, Jesus and the disciples met a man who'd been born blind. And the dis- I love the disciples, because they're a little bit slow. And they say to Jesus, hey, man born blind, who sinned, him or his parents? And obviously they didn't know the the Old Testament scripture, Ezekiel 18, verse 20, where it says each person is responsible for their own sin, not the sin of their parents. But they also didn't appreciate that, you know, the man was born blind. It wasn't his fault. How could he have sinned before he was born? So Jesus says to them, look, it's neither. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened in order that God might be glorified. God can be glorified in suffering, but also in his healing. And it's Jesus who does the healing, not us. If you're a doctor, brilliant. God will use your God-given skill to help bring healing. But for most of us who aren't doctors, we can still pray 
and in his name, filled with the presence of his spirit, we can be confident that God heals. And throughout the New Testament, healing is a sign of the breaking in of God's kingdom. And by God's kingdom, we don't mean government or rule, but the rule and reign of God primarily in people's hearts and minds. Now, not everyone, when we pray, not everyone is healed. Why? Because God's kingdom is not yet complete. It's not here in its fullness on earth and won't be until Christ returns at the end. Then it will be complete. No more sickness, no more suffering, no more tears, no more death. But in the meantime, we pray and we do see God's kingdom break in as a sign of what is to come. And we do see healing. Not always, but we do. We used to say that we never prayed for healing and we never saw anyone get healed. Now we pray for lots of people to be healed and some are. Um, and, and I think sometimes we get a bit scared of offering to pray for people just in case either they aren't healed or we think, well, if they're not a Christian, they might think it's a bit weird. But actually, what we find is most of the time if we offer to pray for somebody, they're very, very thankful. I remember when I left university, it was my very first job in an office. I'd been there two weeks. I bumped in a corridor. I bumped into one of the sales guys on the team, and he had a support on his elbow. And I asked him, what's wrong? He said, oh, well, I go to the gym, and yesterday I, was, I overdid it a bit, and I'm, I'm in an absolute agony. I've damaged my elbow. And without thinking of it, I just blurted out. I said, oh, well, can I pray for you to be healed? And he, he looked a bit shocked and said, well, we're in a busy corridor, not here. Uh, oh, I've got a meeting, got to go. I thought, oh no, what did you do, Miles? That was so embarrassing. He obviously felt uncomfortable. You shouldn't have said anything. So I spent the next couple of days trying to avoid this guy. <laughs> if I saw him coming down the corridor, I thought, oh, I've got a meeting this way. <laughs> here he is again, quick, the gents. And I, I just stayed out of his way. Until on the third day, I walked around the corner and bang, he was there. Do you know what he said to me? He said, Miles, where have you been? <laughs> I've been sitting in my office waiting for you to come and pray for my elbow. I thought, well, do you know what? Most people like it if we offer to pray for them if they're sick. Because what it says is, I care for you. I want you to be well. It offers hope. I remember the very first healing here at HTBB. We just started the 5 p.m. service and um, I was just getting to the uh, end of the talk and beginning the prayer ministry. And Hong Chi walked in at that point. He'd been stuck in a jam and literally, poor guy, first time he turns up, he walks through as I'm saying, amen, to the talk. <laughs> But he hears a prophetic word given from the stage at the start of the prayer ministry. There's somebody here with really bad lower back pain. I believe God wants to heal you. And that was him. He had a partially slipped disc. He was in absolute agony. And he thought, hey, that's me. So he didn't even bother sitting down. He just kept walking and came all the way to the front. And then someone prayed for him who'd never really prayed for healing before. They just laid a hand on his back and in the name of Jesus prayed for healing. And Hong Chi was healed. He went home the next morning, got up, went for a run. No pain at all. And the thing is, when you see a healing like that or you hear the testimony, the story of it, your faith that God could do it again rises. So you pray a bit more and then you see another one and then another one and then you just want to pray for anything that moves. And because healing is a sign of the inbreaking of the kingdom, it should be accompanied by the proclamation of the kingdom of God as well. Interestingly, Jesus here says, heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God is near. He doesn't say it the other way around. He doesn't say proclaim the kingdom and heal the sick. He goes, no, first of all, give them a demonstration of the power. Heal the sick and then proclaim. There's some interesting research that's just been done in China looking at um, people who come to faith in Jesus, surveying them. 
And one of the results out of that research was astonishing, surprising even. What it showed was that of, it showed that 90%, 90% of those surveyed who'd come to faith in Christ said they'd come to believe because of healing, prayer for healing. Heal the sick, pray. And that leads on to the fourth P, which is proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus just says it simply, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Many people think that God is far away, that they're the sort of people that God could never love, could never forgive, or certainly would never use. I don't know, maybe you feel a bit like that. God is near you. He wants to use you. Jesus says, my kingdom is near. And this is good news. Actually, that's what the word gospel, of course, means. Good news. We should be bringers of, God, of God's good news. He wants to use you for that. In Isaiah 52, verse 7, it says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace. Do you want to have beautiful feet? Forget a pedicure. Bring good news. Proclaim the kingdom. Now, this doesn't mean we have to preach at people. Certainly not. But we can let them know that Jesus loves them and that he is near. Now, we're not responsible for how people then uh, receive that message or, or what they do when they hear it. And here in the passage, Jesus goes on and he can contrast the relative unbelief of the Jewish towns of Chorazin and Bethsaida and of his own headquarters, Capernaum. He contrasts their relative unbelief with the Gentile Phoenician cities of Tyre and Sidon who had not had the chance to hear him preach and who had not had the chance to, hear him do, to see him do miracles. But remember that when you share your faith, whether people embrace you or reject you, the message that you give, they're ultimately not embracing or rejecting you. They're embracing or rejecting Jesus and your Father in heaven. Jesus says this in verse 16. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects him who sent me, the Father. And a very easy way, of course, to share this good news is by inviting people on Alpha. A friend of mine told me just last week how when she was leading a small group uh, on Alpha, uh, a woman turned up on uh, week uh, four as a guest. That week the topic is, how can I have faith? And my friend said to her, oh, what made you come along on Alpha? And the woman said, well, I'm a waitress and um, I, I work in a restaurant near, nearby and um, just this past week, I was waiting on, and a group of people came and sat at a table, and I served them. And she said they were so nice, the whole night. She said they were polite, they really took an interest in me, uh, they were fun, they were just so warm. In fact, they were the nicest guests I've ever served. So she said at the end of the evening, I thought, I'm just gonna have to say something to them. So she, uh, went to them and said, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you're so nice, how come? And one of them said to her, well, it might be because we're, we're Christians and we believe everyone is made in the image of God, so that includes you, and so we try to treat everybody with that respect because you are made in God's image. And then the guy that was sitting at the table amongst them said, yeah, and that means that Jesus loves you. Would you like us to pray for you? And she was like, what, now? And he went, yeah. And she went, okay. So they prayed for her very briefly. And then he said to her, why don't you try an Alpha course just down the road? So she said, that's why I came tonight. She said, but I normally work on Wednesday nights. So... I won't be able to come for the rest of the course. 
So my friend said, well, that's okay. Um, why don't we exchange numbers and we'll meet for a coffee um, sometime in the next week or two when it, when it suits. So my friend arranged that, went out for coffee with her. And she said to the, the waitress, how are you doing? And the woman said, well, actually, I've become a Christian. My friend said, wow, how? It's uh, amazing. And she said, well, I came on Alpha, I ate the food, I watched the video, how can I have faith? I enjoyed the discussion. So that night when I went home in my room, I just prayed and, and I asked Jesus to come into my life. She said, it's amazing. You see, what had happened was those, those diners, that group of Christian friends, they had carried the presence of Jesus into that restaurant. And what they'd effectively said to that young woman was, hey, you know that Jesus loves you and the kingdom of God, therefore, is near. You can be part of it. You know, maybe there's somebody that's on your heart right now that you think, gosh, maybe I could say that to them. Proclaim the kingdom. The fifth way in which we can carry God's presence effectively is this. Use the power and authority given to you by Jesus. Verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In other words, when we move in God's power and authority, the enemy faces defeat. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Here, when he sent the 72 out, Jesus, in those words, delegates his power and authority to the 72. But then a little later, at the end of Matthew's gospel, at the Great Commission, he delegates it to all disciples, all followers of him. That includes you and me. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth is mine. Now I'm giving it to you. Go in my name. This is amazing. And authority and power are not the same thing. Authority means that you have the right to do something. Power gives you the means to do it. So in the name of Jesus, the name that's above every other name, in his name you have the right to move in the kingdom, to see things happen in his name. But by his spirit's power, you have more than enough power to then see it come into being. You know, um, when uh, we started HTBB, that first Alpha Weekend Away, it was about, the church was about two months old. We were much smaller then. So nearly all of the leaders in the church, and actually, if I'm honest, pretty much all of the congregation, were away on that weekend away in Malacca. And just a few people came back for the Sunday service. Not many people were there, maybe about 40 people or something. But one woman came in who had never been to church before. She'd been invited along by someone that week, and she turned up. And uh, Dan, our associate vicar, was preaching, and at the end, he invited people to come forward for prayer. And because this woman um, had never been in church before, she didn't realize it was an option, a choice. She just thought, oh, the pastor's told me I need to come forward for prayer. I'll come forward for prayer. <laughs> so she bravely came forward for prayer. I think she was the only person who came forward for prayer. <laughs> and one of the prayer team just laid a hand on her and said, in the name of Jesus, will you fill this woman now with your presence, with your power? And she began, after a while, to uh, moan. Uh, and moan. And it got louder and louder. And it went on and on. And the poor prayer team were there going, what, what, oh no, this is embarrassing. Because this poor woman was moaning at the front with 40 people just standing there looking at her. <laughs> I went on. Well, they said it felt like forever. But then the, this sort of peace descended and this woman went still and quiet. Something amazing had happened. That was on the Sunday. 
Three days later, Wednesday evening, it was Alpha again. She turned up for the first time at Alpha, bringing her husband. And in the small group, they said, oh, brilliant, good to see you, what brought you along? The husband, quick as a flash, spoke up. He goes, this is my wife. She has a terrible temper, really struggles with anger. She punches me. But on Sunday, it stopped. <laughs> I'm quite glad. I've come here. What on earth did you do to her? <laughs> and can I do the same? And that was the start of their journey. They're now baptized and they, they attend a church closer to where they stay. What had happened? was that poor woman had been sort of gripped by a spirit of anger for many years. But in the power, the authority of Jesus' name, when she was prayed for, that spirit had been expelled. And it transformed not just her life, but her husband's life as well. So what I want to say to you really is, look, maybe you're here today and you're facing a situation that feels impossible to change. You're, you feel stuck and it feels grim. In the name of Jesus, you can pray with a power and authority that perhaps you never realized you had before. And we can pray with you at the end if you like. I believe you're gonna be amazed at what will happen. And then finally, the final P is perspective. You can have an eternal perspective. Verse 20, Jesus says, however, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. He says, see the bigger and longer term picture. Rejoice not at the thrill of your ministry or your present situations or successes because they might be temporary. Rather, rejoice at the assurance of the joy that will be yours at the end of time when Jesus returns and the kingdom comes in its fullness. Because your names, and this is to you and to me as well, your names are written in heaven. Eternal life in Christ is yours. And maybe you're the type that struggles to get your head around this amazing concept or to conceptualize eternity. That's okay. You can still know it's joy, though, even if you don't fully understand it. Because joy is a fruit of the Spirit. In the very next verse, verse 21, it says of Jesus, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit. You can be filled with joy as you're filled with the presence of of Christ, his spirit. And ultimately, ultimately, the way we carry the presence of Jesus everywhere is by being filled with his spirit. So shall we pray? Would you like to stand, please? Let's just pray that prayer once again. Let's pray that simple prayer of come Holy Spirit. And um, you might want to put your hands out in front of you as a sign of saying, Lord, I want to receive. Ephesians 5.18, Paul's writing to Christians, to believers, and he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Present continuous tense there, over and over again. This is not so much to do about destiny, but to do about empowerment and intimacy. So pray this in your heart. Come, Holy Spirit, will you fill me right now with the presence of Christ?